Today, we have a global society where, uh, with all the efforts of multilateral institutions, wonderful efforts of organizations like those represented in this room, uh, I think everyone will agree, we don't really have anyone who's in charge at the global level. We don't have any individuals or institutions that have the authority to ultimately direct the way the world should change its behavior to address pressing challenges that we have today. And the issue is, what do you do? What do we, what type of leadership is effective in addressing issues where nobody specifically is in charge, but, but many, many agencies in many different sectors have to cooperate to make this happen? And this is the question that we're asking because we think it, it's so relevant to our world dilemma today. The headlines in the paper were 11,000 climate scientists from around the world released a, a, a paper asserting that we have a planetary emergency on climate change. We know very well that the scientific community has been working for decades to communicate this. And as heartening it is to see 11,000 scientists coming out, we also know that it's naive to expect that one more proclamation by the scientific community is going to get us the change, which is why people like Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for the Future are attracting so much tension and hope. Because instead of representing the experts in academia who are talking about this problem, they're representing at the other end of the spectrum. The new generation who doesn't claim expertise in anything, but are the future inheritors of what we do today, saying something has radical has to change. So the subject of leadership which we're talking today really spans everything from the expert knowledge in our scientific communities to the next generations that have to be mobilized in order to make things happen much faster than they do today. And with this is coming at a particular time. It's coming at a time we all know of unprecedented speed, unprecedented complexity at the global level, unprecedented uncertainty about where we're going to end up and, and how we're going to get there. Uh, and the challenges, whether they're in the field of uh, ecology or in ec rising economic inequality or migration or cultural tensions or social or retreat from democracy, I'm American, which we see uh, in, in, in going on in different places. We've got a multi-dimensional complex of challenges that's unprecedented uh, at the level where we don't have the institutions and maybe we don't have the knowledge of how do you govern a global community under these circumstances and take it to the next level of coordinated and synergistic action. Now clearly, the organizations represented in this room and others who don't have a great deal of knowledge and experience that they have drawn from their own work in different countries, in different sectors. And we're not, uh, in fact, why we want to, why we're doing this is we want to draw on, we want to consult you and draw on your expertise and your experience and say, what can we learn? from green revolutions or American civil rights movements uh, or even the New Deal which uh, solved the, the worst banking crisis in U.S. history or many, many others, uh, the, uh, the work of WHO on AIDS or oral rehydration or the work of OHCHR on uh, dealing with horrendous refugee uh, problems. You have rich experience. What we're hoping is that by consultations with you and other sectors of the society, uh, that we can draw on some conclusions that go beyond the traditional conception of leadership as to what the individual does, or what an individual does within his organization, or what uh, political leaders do within their national framework, with what we can do at the global level. Uh, to move forward very rapidly uh, to meet multiple challenges of, uh, of greatest importance and uh, power. At a time when, for whatever reason, uh, uh, we have a, a tendency to discredit and retreat from the idea that multilateralism is going to solve our problems, if anything, instead of strengthening 
our international organizations and our coordination of them, we're working in an environment, we're flowing, we're going against the stream. So therefore, we've got to look at how we leverage all the knowledge we have and all the power and capacity we have in the most effective possible way. And there, we can learn a lot from traditional models of leadership but we don't think we can be limited. We think we have to, with the help of all those involved, we have to rethink even our concepts of leadership because what we're talking about is leading the society, not just leading uh, groups or organizations. How do we do that? How do we bring global society not only along with us, but release the energy and movement of the society so that we have to struggle to keep up with their demands and their expectations, as we've seen in the past. This initiative actually started a long time ago. In 2013, uh, we partnered with the UN here in Geneva for an international conference. We had about 200 diplomats uh, and representatives of NGOs and uh, in international organizations to look at what we call global social challenges and opportunities. And as you can see, they covered the full spectrum uh, and we had groups on all of them. And the last six years, we've been working, okay, we know we've got problems and everybody, there are enough people working on them uh, and we know there are a lot of solutions, but how, we, how do we make it happen? And why hasn't it happened already? Why haven't we seen a lot more progress on these areas? Is there something missing? And if there's something missing, there must be knowledge and experience that we're not fully drawing on that can help us catalyze it and make it happen. And that's the purpose of our uh, discussions here. This is the context for our, uh, for our project. We're not specializing in any particular field. We're looking at the need for coordinated leadership at, that covers all the sectors, all the fields. Even with the SDGs, which are an unprecedented example of leadership at the global level, uh, the idea of the global community of 193 countries coming together and agreeing on a set of goals and 169 targets uh, is absolutely unprecedented. And we all know that agreeing on, it's a great achievement it, that it shows that universality we have heard of shared needs and goals, but we also know that the implementation of these 17 goals uh, is a very complex issue. It requires a lot of knowledge we don't have, especially when we look at the interactions and interdependence between these goals. That's where, so this is a complex system, uh, and we don't know what will happen. When we move on one area, we do know. When we move in progress on some areas, that's going to result in conflicts and further problems in others. And so we really need to think about, it's no longer leadership in a sector, leadership in an organization, leadership in a, a narrow field of responsibility. We've got to look at leadership in its widest context of the interdependence between different sectors of the global society and how do we coordinate and uh, progress so that we're not going forward in some areas and backward in the others. And there are many organizations working on different dimensions of this who recognize the conflicts, recognize the problems, but even when we understand them, we're still gonna need a way, how are we gonna coordinate it? How are we gonna move in, in some uh, agreement on it? So, when we talk about leadership, it's not just a question of individuals. Setting goals is a form of leadership, shared, creating a shared vision, projecting values that we all share. Organizations working together are a, a power, can be a powerful form of leadership, as many of you have seen, and seen even though you're uh, relative to the, the, the scope of the world and the resources you have, you've seen how international organizations can play a catalytic role way beyond their mandate, their financial resources uh, and all, as a catalyst for something larger themselves. Uh, values can do that, ideas can do that. Uh, even measures, indicators of progress. When we started this project, one of the requests of the Director General was Please, please be sure that we also talk about the need to replace uh, GDP as our uh, as our measure.
because here's a measure that's categorically contradictory to uh, achieving many of the SDGs that we hold so, uh, so dear that we, we must do. So we know that also is a leadership role in getting an, an, the right types of measures. The right types of theories in our international group on economics, we are arguing that unless we change our theoretical conceptions, we're not going to get the changes in policies and institutions we need because the institutions are relying on the theory uh, of academia as the justification for what they're doing. Uh, and unless we challenge the theory itself, so this goes all the way back to our educational institutions, to our research institutions and all, and even to the type of thinking we do. We need to, we need to be teaching our youth in, a, in the educational system uh, to look at things in a much more global, inclusive way as complex systems, uh, as human-based systems, not mechanical uh, uh, apparatus and how do we put the humanity back into our education and our social sciences. All of this is part of it. So we're not excluding anything, but we're looking, we're trying to look at the, all the dimensions and see what we can learn from what has uh, worked in the past. And finally, how do we get, rouse the, 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 the public uh, to act in a way to actually carry out the changes in culture, the changes in behavior that we need. We have examples of all these things in the past. Not at the level and magnitude that we need today, but we have enough knowledge if we mine that knowledge and systematically apply it collectively. And that's the purpose of this project. So let me tell you a little bit more about the project. That we conceive of it with five stages. The first is uh, consultations with the stakeholders, and that's going to take place for about a year. And uh, this is the, the purpose of this briefing was really to start those discussions. We want to find out from you who are interested and willing how we can consult with you, how we can learn from your experiences, what you have to share with us, and how we can do that over the next one year. Then a year from now, and I think the dates have already been finalized, October, at least provisionally, October 27th and 28th, which is just the week of the uh, 75th anniversary of the UN uh, uh, on the 20th, which happens to fall on a Saturday, the 24th. Uh, so we'll have a, a large gathering here uh, uh, in, at the UN in Geneva uh, of representatives of all these stakeholder groups and others to feed back the results of these consultations and to project them to a larger community. There'll also be a final written report which we are inviting our stakeholder partners to contribute to as you and many others we are in touch with, I mentioned a few, uh, as we go on. And then after the conference and the report, for us it's really just the beginning, because the question is, how do, we, how do we reach out to educational institutions, training institutes, how do we use the media, how do we use the arts and other forms of communication to take the knowledge that comes from the project and reach out to as far as we can to the global community. So if we have media and uh, experts and many of your organizations have a lot of experience with this, we would welcome uh, knowledge of that as well. And then to see specifically as we go through, what can this project contribute to the achievement of the SDGs? SDGs is not, uh, it's, a, it's a big enough target uh, to be, it, we're not exclusively on that, but if, if we can contribute to that, we would feel certainly the project's been very beneficial. So here's a list of the, uh, the stakeholder groups that we have on our list. The international organizations, that's the significance of this as the first step, this meeting. Nation states, uh, educational institutions. We're already talking to a number of international institutions about partnering with us uh, on what we can learn from what, what the universities are doing. Science and technology, we are in uh, further, uh, we're in pretty far along in discussions with IEEE, which some of you may know is the largest professional organization of engineers in the world, 
about 400,000 members, and we've had detailed discussions with them, uh, and they're interested to be one of our consulting partners. Uh, with the business and finance community, we are, the Academy was a, a co-organizer of a conference at the UN in New York on September 12th and 13th, uh, looking at the future of finance and capital and how it has to change and how we will try to influence the direction and we have people from the industry who really are convinced that we have to change the direction of how our financial markets and our, our management of, of finance are, are going. So we'll be looking for partners in business and the financial community. Civil society organizations, we have a briefing this afternoon with NGOs who have been invited by uh, the UN for a similar event. Next generation youth groups. We've already started contact and we are, uh, uh, we're through the UN here and in New York looking for which are the organizations that could be most representative who are most committed to addressing uh, the global social challenges. And then to that we have, and after that media, and, and I would add also the arts and how we can uh, uh, mobilize the tremendous capacities of the, uh, of the arts to, for, for outreach and communication and understanding. I'm going to end my presentation with a set of questions. And they're questions for you and your organizations. And I, we would, I would welcome questions about what I have spoken, but also welcome any experiences or insights you have from your experience where you are now, or where you have worked before, or where your organizations are working, that you think would be rel relevant to our consultations and the project that we're initiating. So our, for the consultations, our steps are, first of all, to identify partners within UN agencies and national governments who would like to partner with us, have something they would like to contribute, and then we will work with them on how do we do that in the most effective way? Uh, we are not looking for information in the traditional uh, area where we can send a 30-page questionnaire and expect to. What we are interested in is insights from experience. Uh, so if we raise questions, it's designed to encourage our partners to think about these issues and reflect on their own experience and come back to us with what what they think and what you think is relevant to the project. Uh, one of the things we'd like to know is examples from your experience of highly e effective leadership at the global level. I mean, if you're from an international organization where you see something that's been done that has had global outreach. That doesn't mean we're not, in, we are also interested in effective leadership at the national level or at any community level that has gone beyond leadership within a norm, an institution to leadership of, a, of the society at any level. But I, I, I lead with the global level because that's really the territory we're trying to influence and many of you have been doing things on that basis. Secondly, if we look at that experience, those success stories, and many of the success stories have been told, but I'm not sure, at least for the world in general, that we've always understood the principles behind those successes, the principles that we could take and apply uh, to other contexts effectively. We do things, we succeed. It doesn't mean that we fully understand how we succeeded or why, or we can tell somebody else how to do the same thing. It requires a, a different level of awareness of conceptualization uh, that comes after the experience usually, not during it. Uh, so uh, we'd like to help, we'd like to work with you and learn to think about your successes and what we can learn from it that could be transferable to other areas. Then third, innovative leadership ini initiatives your organization is currently working on. Maybe it's not something that has made the headlines in terms of measurable impact now. But we are also encourage you to reflect on the role your organizations are trying to play now in being in a, a leadership movement at a wider level. And then uh, insights based on your experience. 
What do you see that could be done to enhance and accelerate global progress on any of the challenges that we face today? In other words, your knowledge and experience, which is not yet fully institutionalized in the strategies that are being employed. What can we learn from that? Because let's start with what, uh, with what we know already and then think of extending that knowledge to other areas. And then fifth, what's the kind of change in thinking we need in order to unleash effective action? What type of thinking should we be giving our engineers and our scientists to understand not just the fields of expertise within which they're working, but the, the social context in which they're working and the implications and ramifications of the introduction of new technologies in any field on the wider society. That essentially was one of the rationale for the founding of the World Academy because uh, uh, scientists in, of different types realize that our education is not preparing us to live in a global, interconnected, highly complex society. So what do we have, what do we have to learn about the way we think and change the kind of education we're giving and the kind of thinking that we're teaching? And finally, uh, what can we do to change the way we think about mobilizing social initiative? You have many successful examples in isolated fields. What can we learn from that about mobilizing social participation at the global level uh, to address all of these challenges? Uh, at some stage along the way, we'll encourage our consulting partners to produce briefing papers where their ideas have solidified uh, in the context of the project, which would serve as a basis for the design of the uh, conference, of the main conference, for organizing consultations, uh, webinars, personal gatherings where we can interact with you, understand your perspectives, and learn as much as we can from them. And then after the main conference, to also give inputs to the final report uh, so that you, could, you would have an opportunity to contribute uh, in writing what you think is really important so we're sure that it's taken into account at the time of the project, the final report. And after the main conference, we'd also be looking at how we can work together uh, and in what form, how we can have an alliance of those who really uh, who really buy into this idea that yes, it's not enough we need in a field. Uh, it, it, we have to figure out a way uh, to, that, that's all encompassing, that doesn't have any limits or categories or divisions in it. So with that, if I could just ask my colleagues to join us on the podium. When we say, what do we need? What are we going to do? Yeah, we, defining we would be very important. Because from the stuff that you've dissected, um, we are up against a pretty heavy odds. And among these odds, maybe the heaviest and the largest is the Westphalian thinking of the member states, nation states. And uh, so who is we? How do we create that we? How do we make that we a player? And how do we then, this we, how do we then um, interact, negotiate with the member states, how they involve this we uh, in order to let loose the Westphalian knee-jerk instincts, which unfortunately are uh, only strengthening. The we here at this stage, that's why our concept of, the, of this project is to consult a wide range of stakeholders. And when we we have decided from the beginning that we, in this case, the World Academy and the UN as our partner have agreed that this is not to be just a report of what an academy or even the UN institutions think should be done. We want to consult as wide a group of stakeholders as possible and project what has worked and what we think is needed and what will work. One of the rationale for this program is, let's really see where the decision-making is. It's a, it's, it's a collective uh, 
act of wisdom in, in many ways. But of course, we are, we are defining it as, as well. So the, the project is, uh, the program is a visionary program, but it's also very practical. And what Gary has highlighted is uh, really a scheme that we have with uh, timelines, uh, with uh, uh, a process that has already started, but that we are announcing today with a view to elicit your views and to bring you on board. So the we will be defined when at some point, not that we want to close the circle, but we expand the circle. We already have many partners on board. I mean, Reynolds represents one, um, and, and Gary uh, has mentioned that. But the idea is to go beyond, because the, the eight uh, areas of work on which we will concentrate are extremely demanding and have lots of ramifications. Because of this reason, we are here really to seek your views and to be guided by you. That, at that point, we can say who we are. Only, only at that point. Thank you. One thing we know, when we are concerned and we care like this, that the academics, this is self-criticism, that the academics are belated thinkers, then the institutions are reactive actors. Yes? We are not that good at anticipation. With as much knowledge, with as much information, with as much motivation, that's the truth. What emerges in the streets, what emerges through cultural movements is so profound that it forces us to rethink our values, rethink our governance principles, rethink our measures of action, any of that. And then we come up with policies with which we kind of set new social norms within which we act to what we are responsible and to, what, to, what, to which we are accountable, right? At the same time. What is emerging in the world right now, what is taking shape, is exactly what we are focusing on in this project, in a proactive, not reactive, proactive manner, in anticipatory manner, in inviting manner, in diverse and inclusive way to bring in as many possible voices from as many institutions, from your own personal experiences of the people that motivate you in terms of leadership, in terms of what leads you and the way you lead on a daily basis in your lives, in your organizations, in your communities, in all of your practices. So to do this requires a certain kind of perspective that is anticipatory and that the we that is taking shape is already taking place in the streets and to address the segment of, of, of your powerful question to say how, how do we sit at the stakeholder table with nation states and tell them how about you need to loosen up the reins a little bit, right? And support this collective project and how about others need to be mobilized more? How do we do this? First of all, there are forces in the flux. They're happening through refugees. They're happening through youth mobilizing. They're happening through people being fed up with corruption. They're happening with people being concerned about feeling that they're planetary beings, right? They're showing up. People are showing up. Are we going to find a way to channel that energy, to understand our collective energy, and to direct it in a conscious evolutionary way, rather than a random flailing and through even the notion of you know, damage control. We don't want that. We want proactive, positive, inviting and inclusive way to connect, to convene, to gather knowledge, which is to synthesize knowledge and to synergize efforts. Because it's already taking place. Let us not be delayed. I think we have also to add the dimension of catalyzing things that we are aware of, but we are not doing. And when I say we this time, I, I mean everyone. <laughs> and I will I, I, I use the example of education, what does everyone mean? We, uh, in education, as a group, are we focused in the last decades mainly on putting kids on uh, school, not so much on public. And today, we have uh, millions of teachers never train 
on sustainable development. Net, not even trained on uh, the digital transformation. So the pedagogy is so old, and for this reason, a lot of kids drop out because they don't find you know, something to keep them focused in the school. So on one hand, we spend a lot of resources to put the kids in the school. On the other hand, we lose them because it is not too interesting for them. Also, let me speak on another level. We have 35,000 universities as a work level, recognized by the government, because the International Association of Universities is doing, among other things, let's say the catalog of global universities, in order to be able, the government to recognize diplomas and so on. How many universities out of the 35,000 do you think decided officially to interdict plastic in the institution. A very small decision, but with a huge impact, because it, was, it would not be just an administrative decision, but it would be a cultural decision, because the graduates will be aware that this is not good. We have discussed about a lot of questions for which we don't have answers, but there are many questions for which we have answers, but we don't do anything. Another example, medical school. Schools, please look at any program of any medical school around the world and you will not find a class about public policies. Yes. You will find just classes how to treat someone ill already, but not how to avoid someone to become ill. And generally they say it's a matter of politicians, but public policies in health Sure, politicians play a role, but it's good the medical doctors to be trained on uh, uh, this. Other mistakes, agriculture, we are speaking about sustainable development. Please look in the same curriculum in agriculture universities to see the sustainable development dimension. I have done this and not so many. So, what I'm saying, we are looking for answers, we are looking for ideas, we are looking to be imaginative, but at, at the same time we are trying to, to see some effects immediately. And for this reason, the networks that already exist, we don't want to invent something else. We have the International Association of Universities, African Association of Universities, so they are already there with 10 people in a room you can spread the information at the level of 35,000 universities. And this process, including the conference, have, uh, has as an objective also to increase the awareness from the big questions without answers to the small gestures that will help us to reach our objectives. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question from the representative of Pakistan because you pointed to the richness and wealth of knowledge, yet ineffectiveness in, in leadership. That's that's a gap to think about, right, and address. And the second thing is like, where are these pockets? What are the things that we don't know we don't know, right? And typically where we find them is where there's a lack of collaboration. It's actually, the wealth of knowledge is ineffective and the gaps are found the places where we lack collaboration between institutions, uh, lack of transdisciplinary view, right? And lack of systemic view and an understanding that we are, that there's the concept of interconnectedness, that we are part of a very sensitive living ecosystem, right? But they're exactly at that problem place is the potential for solution because that new awareness of the interconnectedness is pushing us to come together and have to collaborate this way to synthesize that knowledge, right? In order to be able to derive a sense of direction for the global society because, you know, we have went through a stage of mondalisation, as they say, right? In, in, in French philosophy, of an understanding that we are a world together. But we're now going to a sense of global society and higher than that, we're going to a sense of planetary belonging that is going to push us. We're, in other words, we're going to have to decide on how we're going to lead the, these social processes. And it's exciting to be able to be at the place where the questions are rising, where capacities to collaborate together are also rising. And to the question about the, the distribution of power, another ex extremely sensitive question, is you know the, the sense that there are some countries that are simply the dumping ground 
for other people's consumerism. There are the sense of the tremendous paradox of the heart of Africa, where you have the richest country in the world that is hungry. It's nonsensical. It's an old mindset that is lacking perspective and, and is holding a grip on a power structure that is, that is most importantly, becoming ineffective. And that's what's being, uh, even to the power structures, it's becoming more and more apparent. That the nation states are not gonna be able to resolve on their own without lack of collaboration, right? Any of the spillover of the moving problems that are spilling in the streets with the ecology, with the issues. So the problems are multiple, they're flowing, they're spilling over, and we are forced to be at the place of joint knowledge to decide what that process of leadership collectively is going to be. That's why I find this exciting to be here with you. Yeah, but may I add something? Yes, please. Uh, just, uh, to re-emphasize what the distinguished representative from human rights said, the concept of leaving no one behind, that is very core to the United Nations missions these days. I think that this is an effort we have really to, to do together, because to collect the evidence, to collect the, uh, 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 the examples that come from the community level uh, is a hard task. And, and, and I don't think that we are able to do it, certainly not alone. But this is, these are the prominent examples that we really need. I mean, the examples of leaderships, of leadership that, that are really striking nowadays are the ones at community level. So help us to gather those examples. We, we might have a methodology, we were talking about methodology, uh, we have illustrated that, but certainly we need more sources of information in order to draw these examples and, and portray them and represent them. Because only if we represent those examples, we really leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes we just have to recognize our model is wrong. And I'll give you a concrete example. Yesterday I participated in Brussels to the launch of European University Initiatives. I'm not going to speak about this, but there were more or less 800 rectors across Europe, many of them having interventions, and one rector said a group of researchers from Khan University studied the mortality, child mortality, and they found there a lot of very interesting things. The report was done, uh, uh, finished six months ago, and is not public. Why? Because the researchers are waiting for a scientific article to be published in a journal because we are assessed based on our uh, impact of our research in scientific journals. It's a crime. So, in my university, the contribution of a researcher at the public policy is not considered part of the evaluation. So, we have to recognize we are a school of governments and we assess our professors based on Shanghai rankings, internationalization. So this is a global mistake. It's not just our mistake. So very, very, and you know, child mortality is one of the indicators for sustainable development goals. Our goal is to be a network of networks. Each of our members is itself part of other networks. And we look to reach out and find that commonality where we can work together, because that's the only way these issues can be tackled. Thank you. Good luck to all of us. Thank you.